Coming to you from deep inside the bowels of a great big empty. Get ready for another episode of The Home Defense Show with Skip Coriel. Hello, American families. Welcome to this week's episode of The Home Defense Show. I'm your host, Skip Coriel. And if you love your family, care about them deeply, and want to learn how to protect them in every facet of your life, then you've come to the right place. We got a great show for you today, and I know that you're going to love it. Boy, today we are going to talk about home defense, in particular, door defense. Right now, go to thedoordefense.com and check out that website. Uh, we're going to be interviewing a gentleman named Doug Gerzina. Um, he is the owner of D&G Innovations. And we're going to talk about how you can make your front door, your back door, any door in your house more secure. Maybe even the master bedroom uh, door uh, just for just for a few dollars and without major construction on your home. Uh, so we'll be talking about that in segments two and three. And I think you're going to love that and your family will be safer because of that. Now, before we get going uh, any farther. Remember a few weeks ago, we had Mark Walters from Armed American Radio. We had him on the show, and uh, Mark and I, we always have a good time talking, but, you know, because we're friends, but we were talking about, you know, weight gain, and I mentioned Mountain Dew, and he said, I have to retrain my palate. We were talking about diet Mountain Dew. So we're going to give that a try right here. I have an ice-cold Diet Mountain Dew, uh, right here in front of me. So let's crack the Diet Dew. Hold on, here we go. Well, it sounds the same. Not a bad sound. Smell is a little bit funny. Hold on here. Um. Oh my. Ew. The carbonation is the same, but boy, what an aftertaste. I'm, I'm not sure I can retrain my palate that much. Oh, well, I will have to give this some thought. It's still chemicals going into my body. If I'm going to have chemicals in my body, they should at least taste good on the way in. But for today's show, we'll go with the diet, and uh, we'll give it a fair shot. No pun intended. Ah, what's been going on? I have been training a lot of churches these days. Every week, I'll get a call from a different church, uh, usually somewhere in West Michigan. Uh, and I'll go out there, and we'll give them an introductory uh, speech there, usually two or three hours. Uh, help them set up their safety team, and... Then we'll help them qualify on the range and take good records of all their training, things things of that nature. We'll do a walkthrough on their church and uh, point out weaknesses, uh, things that they can modify and make their, their church and their congregation safer. Uh, this morning, I was with a church safety team. Uh, we were at Center Shot Indoor Gun Range out in Door. Michigan. Beautiful gun range. Uh, you folks have got to check it out. It's a good group out there. Uh, Rob and Ron Miller are there. Paul uh, is there. They treat veterans really well. So I recommend that you go out to Door, uh, Door Michigan Center Shot Indoor Gun Range and check them out. I think they even give a 10% discount to veterans. So if you're a vet, even if you're not a vet, check that out. They'll treat you right there, and it's a new, newer facility, uh, state-of-the-art. But today what we did is uh, I've qualified this church before, but today I wanted to take it to the next level. So I kind of surprised everyone there. There were seven of us training, and uh, I said, all right, go ahead and send your target downrange 75 feet. And I got it couple of funny looks there because normally you know we'll be shooting somewhere between 10 and 30 feet because 80 percent of all 
gunfights occur within 12 feet. But it's different in a church. It's a lot different in the church. So I said, hey, send them down 75 feet. So they did that. And they said, well, how many how many rounds per magazine? I said, um, load up with one round magazines. And everybody looked at me real funny. I got a few chuckles. So they loaded it up. And I said, okay, everybody get up on the line here. And you have one second to put one shot in the torso at 75 feet. And... They had never done that before, but they shot. Out of the seven people, just myself and two others were able to put good hits in the torso at 75 feet in one second. And that told me right away what we needed to work on. And we worked on that for two hours uh, between 50 and 75 feet. Because, folks, in your church, it's not a mugging scenario it's not going to be three feet five feet ten feet i mean it could be but it's likely not going to be that way so we had them practice and practice and practice you know from 50 to 75 feet by you know because you could be shooting across the sanctuary you could be shooting down a hallway you could be in the parking lot and all of those scenarios are going to be 50 to 100 feet away if we'd have had a 100, 150 foot range, we would have done it there. But that kind of a shot with a with a handgun, that's a tough shot to make. And if you haven't practiced it, you know, you're going to be hard pressed to make that hit. So, but by the time we got done, um, instead of three out of seven making that hit, we had we had more like five or six out of seven that were making that hit. So it was definitely time well spent, and it was good training for this church safety team. All right, Uh, I'll be doing more of that. I just got a call last week from a church in Iowa, Cedar Falls, Iowa. They want me to come out there for several days and give them some training, and I'm looking forward to that. Uh, So I'll tell you more about that as that uh, transpires. Uh, A little bit, we got a little bit of time for the news here. So let's go ahead and go to uh, one of the law enforcement sites that I go to. It's called CaliberPress.com. That's Caliber, uh, not B-E-R, but B-R-E. So CaliberPress.com. I I saw this article, Preventing Mass Murders, a Summary of the Facts Regarding This Fraught Issue. It's definitely a fraught issue. This was written by... Robert Whitson, Ph.D. Ph.D., what does that say? Oh, he's a, he's a prophylactic doctor. Oh, maybe not. All right. I was a police officer for 30 years, and I have taught criminal justice for 16 years. Okay, so it's not his first rodeo. Nothing I can say will help the people affected, blah, 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 at the Parkland High School. All right. Uh, this is all just uh, gooey, touchy-feely stuff. Crime data, that's where we want to be. Due to media coverage, violent crime and property crime may seem to be at an all-time high. It's not. That's right, folks. In contrast, reported crime is relatively low. According to the FBI's Uniform Crime Report, which is what we go by, violent crime includes murder, forcible rape, aggravated assault, robbery, violent crime. It peaked in the early 1990s, and then in 1992, uh, there were almost 2 million violent crimes reported. Violent crime consistently decreased from 1993 through 2014. Hmm. That's interesting. So basically what they're saying here is for the last 30 years, violent crime has gone down. The only violent crime that has consistently gone up in the last 30 years is mass shootings, churches, schools, businesses. So crime is down. But the media makes it look like crime is up. All right, they talk about several factors here. Mental illness. The vast majority of people with mental illness do not commit violent crimes. That's true. Thank God for that, or most of us would be dead. The challenge is to identify individuals with a mental illness who pose a high risk of committing a violent crime and successfully treat those individuals. Yeah, I think uh, a lot of them now are just out on the streets. They're homeless people. According to the 2016 National Survey on Drug Use and Health, about 18.3% 
uh, of American adults had a mental illness. Ooh. And 4.2% had a serious mental illness. I wonder if that's up or down because, boy, that seems like a, a high rate of mental illness to me. Here's another factor. See something, say something. The Secret Service was assigned to study school shootings and documented their findings. The Secret Service discovered one common denominator among school shooting suspects. They tell someone before the event. That's the case on uh, this last one in Parkland, Florida as well. They usually advertise what they're going to do before they do it. People see it, and they don't say anything. Ah, oh, firearms. Let's see what, see what uh, the cops say about guns here. It's difficult to know how many firearms are in the U.S. Estimates range anywhere between 300 to 360 million firearms. Well, that's a lot of guns. Oh, yeah, tons and tons of guns here. Uh, let's cut to the chase here. It's true that firearms are used to commit homicides and suicides. It's true that some people are accidentally killed by firearms. But it's also true that firearms are used for self-defense and have been used to stop crimes in progress. The following statistics stood out from all the other data. During 2013, there were 2,596,993 deaths in the U.S., only 1.3% of those were related to firearms. You know what? And probably a good portion of those were suicides. So that's really, for all the guns we have, that's not bad. Here's a topic. Gun violence restraining orders, sometimes called red flag laws. Police officers can place someone on a 72-hour 70, mental hold if the person is an imminent threat to, to their self or someone else. The key word is imminent. A person must be a threat at that time. A psychologist will conduct an evaluation and determine if the person should be released or held more than 72 hours. If a person is released, the person can regain possession of their firearms initially taken by the police for safekeeping unless the person was not legally authorized to possess them in the first place. Connecticut was the first state to enact red flag legislation in 1999. Now Washington, Oregon, Indiana, Rhode Island, and California have similar laws. Uh, Indiana surprises me. Indiana is a very, very pro-gun state. They've got some fairly decent uh, gun laws there. Um, so that interests me. Law enforcement can't simply seize a person's firearms for no reason. A judge must issue a restraining order. Okay, that's called due process. I think that is a good idea. Will red flag laws prevent mass murders? The answer is maybe. Nobody knows for sure. But there are several cases that may have been prevented. Uh, Parkland, uh, Sandy Hook, Santa Barbara, Tucson, all Aurora Theater, just to name a few. I guess we just don't know. Ah, the NRA. Some people blame the NRA for the school shooting in Parkland, as well as gun violence, gun violence in general. Well, you know, if gun violence in general is way down in the last 30 years, then you're not blaming the NRA, you're giving them credit. The challenge here is that the NRA clearly opposes weapons in the hands of criminals and would-be criminals. Every time a tragedy occurs, there is inevitably a reaction for stricter gun laws and protests to ban certain types of firearms from everybody. Some want to amend the Second Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, but again, the NRA supports lawful gun use and ownership. Summary. Based on the information presented in this article, gun violence restraining orders, red flag laws, are laws every state should enact. They focus on the behavior of high-risk individuals who demonstrate signs of anger, violence, and poor behavioral control, usually associated with a mental illness, who have access to firearms. Yet, red flag laws still provides individuals due process of law. History has proven that murder, violent crime, and property crime will always exist in a free society. There is always a balance between freedom and safety. On a national basis, crime rates are historically low. Remember that, folks. People need to take reasonable crime prevention precautions, but they don't need to live in constant fear. You know, all in all, that's not a bad uh, article. Pretty good balance, especially coming out of law enforcement. Some people think that law enforcement is, is anti-gun, but I think on the whole, that's probably not true. Uh, certainly not for the rank-and-file officer. But that, not a bad article. Not a bad article at all. That's at caliberpress.com. Okay, folks, we are 
out of time here in, in this first segment. When we come back uh, two minutes from now, we will be speaking with Doug Gerzina from DNG Innovations about the door defense. That is his product that will help harden your home against crime. Take a two-minute break. Head on out. Uh, go to EliteFirearms.us. Find out what Larry Jackson can do to give your family the guns they need to protect themselves. And then go to FirearmsLegal.com slash Midwest Tactical and protect your family against the criminal justice system. This is Skip Coriel on the Home Defense Show. Don't go anywhere. We will be right back. My name is C.J. Coriel. Welcome to the Home Defense Show with my dad, Skip Coriel. Don't go nowhere. We'll be right back. This is Skip Coriel from the Home Defense Show, and I want you to have the very best handgun that money can buy. And that's why we recommend you visit Larry Jackson at Elite Firearms and Training. As a concealed carry instructor, I see people every week out on the range with guns they can't shoot properly because they didn't know what to buy. That will never happen at Elite Firearms and Training. Larry Jackson will personally fit you with your very own personal defense pistol. So call Larry Jackson today at 616-299-8715 or visit EliteFirearms.us. This is Colonel Danny Gillum. I host Front Lines of Freedom, a weekly syndicated military talk radio show. One of my co-hosts is Skip Coriel, the host of this show. We cover things that impact military and veteran communities, and we do it from the veteran's perspective. The show is broadcast across the nation and is also available as a podcast on our website, frontlinesoffreedom.com. Please join Skip and me weekly on Frontlines of Freedom. Okay, folks, welcome back to the Home Defense Show. There's your host, Skip Coriel. As promised in the first segment, we have with us the CEO of D&G Innovations, Doug Gerzina. Doug, welcome to the Home Defense Show. Thanks for having me on. Hey, not a problem, Doug. Now, Doug, I was quite intrigued by your company and the product that you have, you know, primarily because, you know, I teach concealed carry, and part of that is hardening your home against crime, and Boy, you've got uh, some products here that I think will really help my listeners and my students. So uh, first off, I want to thank you for that. But, you know, Doug, before we launch right into uh, your company and your, your product, the Door Defense, D&G Innovations, all of that, um, why don't you just start out by telling the listeners just a little bit about yourself since we don't know who you are yet. I'm basically, uh, I'm an eye doctor. I work for the VA hospital. You know, I've always been an inventor. Uh, I've had my had several of them that I've wanted to produce, and this is my first one. I was talking to my cousin, who is actually in a marketing firm, and kind of told her as if I didn't really do these inventions, and I would never, never know. I don't want to be that guy that says what if. Like I said, this is my first product. Pretty excited about it. I'm also a landlord. I have. Some properties I've had one broken into recently and honestly the uh, police were really no help at all as far <laughs> as like uh, defending the house or catching the perpetrator or anything like that it was more like well it happened to you and too bad yeah is this in an urban environment yes yep. yeah single they, family home yeah they they the police feel like they're busy and they probably are busy, especially if it's in the city. So that's the deal there. That's why it's just so important to know how to protect yourself. I mean, I mean, we don't uh, depend on them to protect us from, say, muggings and things like that. That's why we carry concealed. So why would we depend on them to defend their home when, well, quite frankly, they're they're not there? And, you know, do you really want the cops at your house, you know, outside waiting in the car for someone to steal, you know, break into your home? You probably don't. So... Um, you know, that's why these products that you have are, you know, a really, really good idea. So you, you got this uh, idea, and then you've got a cousin who helped you out with, with marketing. And I see you got a great website. The The website for the listeners out there is thedoordefense.com, thedoordefense.com. You can check that out right now so you guys know what we're talking about here. 
this is just uh, really really awesome you got great videos on there um, you know is your cousin the guy that put this website together because he you know they did a great job uh, she did the marketing and there was another company that actually I uh, subbed out for the website development mm -hmm. uh, called Workbot, and they're out of uh, Erie, Pennsylvania. Um, okay. I'm all all about trying to source, you know, things in in the United States for jobs and everything else. Yeah. Uh, the product is completely American made. Also, on the website itself, we're also doing a promotion where we're giving away a free sample. Mm-hmm. All you have to do is go on the website and put in your information, and we're going to do a drawing for a free sample so we can try and get the word out there. Oh, definitely, definitely. Um, do you have any plans to, I don't know, maybe visit the the SHOT Show? Typically, I'll go to the SHOT Show every year or every other year. Um, that's, you know, the industry, the biggest industry venue of the year, or maybe the NRA convention, something like that. Any Anything like that in the works? Well, right now we have a Kickstarter campaign that's going to be launched in April 2nd. And for the Kickstarter requirements, we're not allowed to sell it at all until that ends. That's going to last probably about 30 days. Then after that, we can market it to other avenues. Ah, oh, I see. Okay. Well, uh, let's talk a little bit more about, you said you worked for the VA. How does one become an eye doctor? For the VA, that is outside my scope of of personal refer or personal uh, experience. Well, it's a, it's the Veterans Hospital. It's in Pittsburgh. I've worked with them for several years now. It's a it's a great facility. You know, I think uh, our veterans should be taken care of as much as possible. Um, they've given so much to us, mm -hmm. and so many of them are you know suffering physically or mentally, and you know, to provide any kind of service to them is, you know, really helps them out. Yeah. Well, I know, you know, over the past 10 years or so, the, the, the VA has taken some lumps as far as public relations wise. Uh, you know, apparently there were some facilities that, that weren't, you know, giving the care that they should have given, or it was a bureaucratic, uh, thing, but it seems to be getting better now. Um, your your hospital there sounds like you guys are doing great and giving good service, and it's not a problem there. Well, the publicity, you know, like anything else in the media, they, they publicize all the bad news, and they don't publicize any of the good. Mm -hmm. uh, the VA has been a wonderful system now. Um, they have state-of-the-art facilities. As far as taking care of their veterans and, and as far as what I've experienced, it's, it's number one. Uh, they don't rely on their doctors saying, like, well, I have to meet cer certain quota. I have to see so many patients. Everything nowadays is controlled by the insurance companies that can control the doctors, that control how much they make. They can control everything. At least with the VA system, they're really trying to put the patient first. Right. And, you know, that's what it's all about. Yeah, for sure. You know, that is encouraging to me because I am a veteran. I spent time in the Marine Corps. And, and so, you know, as I get older, I've noticed that my eyesight isn't as good as it was 20, 30 years ago or even 10 years ago. You know, I'll be out there deer hunting or something. And boy, gosh, I need binoculars to see to see that <laughs> deer. And before I, I didn't I didn't need that. So, uh, you know, this is off the topic. Well, Especially nowadays, you got to know, like, oh, they got to have, you know, one freckle on the side of their face and, you know, 3.5 horns on one side and everything. Yeah, else. that's so right. You really got to know what yeah, you're doing. Yeah, that's for sure, or else you could end up breaking the law. <laughs> but, right, right. Um, this is a little bit off topic, but I'm just personally uh, curious about it. What happens to, I'm 60 years old. What happens? What is happening to my eyesight as I get older? Why can't I see as well? Well, it has to do with the lens of your eye. The lens accommodates, and that's why as you get into your 40s, you need bifocals. The muscle that goes around your lens still does the same thing as it did when you were 20 years old. Unfortunately, the lens material itself gets less pliable. It actually moves inside your eye like an autofocus camera lens does. Mm. So as you get older... It gets less pliable. That way you get more reliant on reading glasses, stuff like that, especially for up close. 
Yeah. Well, I, I'm okay. Well, actually, I, five years ago, I was okay with up close. Now I, now I'm going to have my, my left arm stretched because I, you know, I have to hold, <laughs> hold my, uh, yeah. my, my iPhone out there and I got to get it a little bit farther away. Uh, my big problem though, would be like 20, 30 yards out. Um, you know, things right. get a little fuzzy when I'm out there. So it, it's extremely close, like two feet away. And then, you know, 20, 30 feet out is, is when it starts to go a little fuzzy. So I, I'll wear, you know, like uh, glasses when I'm out on the range. They'll be a very light prescription uh, glasses. Um, and, and I notice that's a, a lot of my students, my concealed carry students. They'll be out on the range, and some of them, they can only shoot when they have their prescription uh, lenses on. What about this... Uh, you know, you hear about LASIK surgery all the time. And, you know, I'm afraid to do that because it seems like they only get one shot at it. And, you know, my idea of a laser is on these James Bond movies, you know, where they're slicing through a tank or something. Uh, I'm not <laughs> sure I want that done to my eyeball. What's the deal with laser surgery? Well, LASIK actually resurfaces your cornea. Like myself, I'm nearsighted. I can see a up close, I can't see far away. So my cornea is too steep. So what they do is flat it, flatten it so it moves the focus point further back on my retina so I can see better. The problem with as you get older, since it's an internal problem with your lens, if they correct your vision for distance with the laser, it doesn't do anything for the up close. You'll ah, still okay. need reading glasses. Okay. So that's an in internal problem. The only way they can get away with that and fix both, they use you, like, use monovision. One eye is set just for distance. The other one is set for oh, up close. God. So I, I guess the moral of the story is don't get old. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> it's not going to. I know that. Well, folks, we are speaking with with Doug Gerzinga from uh, D&G Innovations. Um, he has got a great product called the Door Defense uh, I've watched the video on it on his website. You can go to thedoordefense.com and you can check that out. Uh, we're going to take a, a short break here. We've got two minutes. Go ahead and check out our sponsors. Check out EliteFirearms.us. See what Larry Jackson can do, how he can help your family choose the right firearm the first time around. And then check out Firearms Legal Protection. Go to firearmslegal.com slash Midwest Tactical and you can find out how to protect your family against the uh, criminal justice system should you have to use your firearm in self-defense. When we come back, we're going to be speaking more with uh, Doug Gerzinga from uh, D&G Innovations about his specific product. And I, folks, I think you're going to like this. So take two minutes off, but don't go too far. This is a home defense show. Don't go anywhere. We will be right back. This is Phoenix Cordell on the Home Defense Show. Always use guns safely and wisely. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Hey, folks. I want to tell you about my book, Civilian Combat, the Concealed Carry Book. More and more people across the country are seeing the dangers in society and are deciding to carry concealed to protect themselves and their families. My new book lays it out step by step. It'll teach you how to protect and defend the ones you love. Get the benefit of 17 years of teaching experience and a lifetime of training for this important role in society and in your family. You can get Civilian Combat real easy. Just go to Amazon.com, search on Skip Coriel Civilian Combat, and it'll pop right up there. Don't put it off any longer. Get Civilian Combat, the concealed carry book by yours truly. Wouldn't it be wonderful if life was like the movies and the good guys always won? In today's world, if you're forced to use your firearm to protect yourself, you will need protection. Firearms Legal Protection is here for you. FLP provides you with seasoned, experienced attorneys that handle your criminal and civil matters as a result of you protecting yourself. FirearmsLegal.com provides its members with uncapped attorney's fees, bail bond protection, and coverage in all 50 states. We are not a reimbursement plan. You can access uncapped attorney's fees for as low as $10 a month. Firearms Legal members are provided with educational services, training videos, and access to our vast national attorney network. While you're protecting yourself, let Firearms Legal protect you. Listen up, folks. This is important. 
There are plenty of legal protection services out there, but none will protect you as well as Firearms Legal Protection. This is the one I use and the only one I recommend. Visit firearmslegal.com slash Midwest Tactical and protect your family now. Okay, folks, this is Skip Coriel on Home Defense Show. We are back in segment three with Doug Grazina from D&G Innovations and TheDoorDefense.com. Doug, uh, I've been looking at this product, and this is really just awesome. Go ahead and uh, explain the product right now, what it is, and how it works. Well, it's designed to go on a door that you have installed already it's made out of cold rolled steel it goes over top of the door jam and makes your wood jam into a steel jam oh okay uh there's stainless stainless steel screws that go right into the jam they go into the stud of your house and that way if somebody tries to kick in your door it's virtually you can't do it we tried and tried and tried and broke into it um we used a sledgehammer the actual door broke in two it was a metal door it bent in half before the the product failed wow. the product didn't fail at all it, it had a little teeny dent in it but mm-hmm. it, it actually did not fail at all so yeah. the whole thing with this is adding layers of protection to your house mm-hmm. i understand that people have concealed weapons permit i do too and that's great to basically protect your home but not always do you have your gun on you in the living room, at the front door, ready to go. Uh, Let's say somebody tries to break into your house. How important would it be to have an extra minute, two minutes, three minutes, four minutes, five minutes to call the police to get your weapon ready to protect your home? Because let's face it, if somebody wants to break in through your door, it's not that hard to do. Mm -hmm. Uh, The girl that broke in the door in the video weighed... 120 pounds soaking wet. Oh, wow. Uh, so this, this is really, you know, kind of an eye-opener to people that really think their door is secure when it's, when it's locked, even with a deadbolt. Mm-hmm. It's, it's kind of the misconception of being safe in your own home. Yeah. Yeah, I know, uh, according to FBI crime stats, it takes an average of five seconds to break through someone's front door. And, and people... They'll go ahead and they'll buy this solid steel security door, and they'll they'll mount it, you know, in the conventional manner, and think, well, okay, I'm safe now. It's solid steel; no one's getting through that door. But that's not really the weakness, is it? No, it's not. And it's not about just basically protecting you from, you know, property damage. It's protecting your family. Uh, what if somebody wants to break into your house, not to steal your stuff, but to personally hurt you? Mm-hmm. So that's what it's all about. I mean, you know, honestly, if somebody wants to break in and steal all my stuff, I don't care as long as I'm not hurt personally. But if somebody tries to break into your house, 30% of the time, somebody is at your house still, one of your family members. Right. So, you know, statistics on home invasions are very eye-opening. I never thought this in a million years, but, you know, the... The most common time for somebody to break into your house is between 10 in the morning and to 3 p.m. in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. And 38% of all reported assaults uh, occur because of a home invasion. Um, So the statistics really don't lie. Yeah. Yeah, that that is a lot, and that's just amazing. You know, you you talked about, oh, I forget the wording, but I call it concentric rings of security uh, around your home. And the the door is like the next to last layer of defense because they get through that door and then it's just you and him. It's you and your gun. But, you know, if you can keep them out of that and from going through that door in the first place, then you don't have to shoot them. You don't have to worry about legal bills. I mean, this product that you're that you're showing us here, boy, that could save you, you know, five, six figures in legal bills. Um, you know, possibly your life, uh, the life of your loved ones, or even, um, you know, your freedom, because you shoot someone uh, in your home in the wrong jurisdiction, 
or, uh, you know, it's a questionable shooting, questionable call that you made, boy, you can end up uh, in a world of hurt. So this is uh, this is really great. You know, even, even if it kept them, you know, uh, out of your house for 20 seconds, you know, and I've watched videos, uh, surveillance videos of people breaking through someone's front door. And usually it's like one hit and they're in, you know, and uh, it's like that two by four um, that everything is attached to. It just gives. Um, is that just because it's, it's pine? It's not oak or anything like that? Well, the actual door jam itself is a three quarter inch board. It's made out of pine. And open up your door at home and look at the strike plate where it goes into. Mm-hmm. It's it's a very thin piece from where it's going to put the most pressure. And if you look at the video, you can you can see it just it shatters. Yeah, yeah. And so that's what your product does. You, you said it was did you did you call it cold steel or rolled steel? What did you call that? It's, yeah, it's, it's cold road steel, um, which means it's going to basically, it's going to give a little bit instead of something that's heat tempered or something like that, that might break more as far as a steel product. Mm-hmm. But it goes from the top to the bottom of your door jam. It goes all the way from top to finish. So not only does it protect really well, but also it looks nice. Yeah. It makes your door look, look like a... You know, it's powder-coated white. It looks like a metal door. Uh, there's weather stripping on it as well. It's thicker than the weather stripping that's on your door now. So it helps with energy savings, too. Yeah. So not only does it look nice, it protects well. Yeah. Um, Doug, how long are the, you said they're stainless steel screws. What's the significance of stainless steel? Well, it's not going to rust or corrode. Okay. Same thing with the uh, powder coating. Uh, it's going to protect it from the elements. But the stainless steel screws go all the way through your door jam and into the studs of your house. So there's 11 of them in total. So there's no way that all those are going to give away to let somebody break in through your door. Yeah. Yeah. W- when I look at my door, I open up the door and there's a like a striker plate there. It's, you know, basically rectangular, maybe three inches three inches by two inches, something like that. And it's held in by just uh, like maybe little half-inch screws. And yep. th- that doesn't seem like, like much. Uh, you know, I'm an old man, and I could probably break into my own house. So um, how long Very are... Very easily. <laughs> yeah, how, yeah, how long are the uh, the screws that, that you provide? They're three inches. Okay, so yeah, that's more... And typically when you buy a door from, you know, Menards or where, wherever, it's like a one-inch screw. So you've got a three-inch screw, so that's going to go through the door jam and all the way through that, that first two-by-four, isn't it? Yes. Uh, when they construct a house, there's two-by-fours that are stacked right sandwiched next to each other. Mm-hmm. So it's going to go through the door jam, through that first two-by-four, into the second two-by-four. All right. So there's no way you're going to pull that out. Yeah. Well, and you said there are there are 11 screws holding this this uh, you call it a door jam. Yeah, they're from the top of the door jam all the way to the bottom. So your your door jam is 80 inches in total. So they go all the way from the top to the bottom. Now I think I read on your website that there this thing uh, like the standard is 80 inches inches, but there's also tabs where you can. Uh, reduce the the size the the length the height of it if your door is different yes there is but that's not the height of the door the the height of the door always stays at 80 inches okay the problem becomes the where the deadbolt and the door are set they might be different heights from the bottom of the door jam oh okay all right i got you there's two standard sizes that are that are either uh, two and a half inches separated up or down. So you either break the bottom tab to move it down or the top tab to move it up to fit your door. Okay. Now, here, here's the acid question here. You know, I don't even change my own oil. Um, I, You know, if I want to do anything around the house, I've got to look it up on YouTube to see how to do it. I'm just not mechanically inclined. How tough it is, is it? for me to install this thing because I don't want to have to hire a professional to come in and, and install this. 
it doesn't really take a lot. Now, there's a video as well with me installing it. I don't know if you saw that on the website. But you take your old existing weather stripping off, and it's just kind of held in place. You get a pair of pliers or even your fingers. You pull on it, it comes right off. You put the plate over top of uh, your existing door jam, and you can mark it with a marker if you want, just where the screws go. Mm -hmm. And if you've got a, a drill and tap them first, it probably would be a little easier to install. You don't have to do that. Uh, once you get a couple of screws in, it holds it in place, and you just keep going up or down the line. Uh, it's very simple. It does take a little bit of, uh, I don't know, um, I want to say dexterity, but it, it's very simple. And, you know, if you can if you can put a screw into a, a wall to hang a picture, you can put this on your door. Okay. And so they would they would go to the doordefense.com, and I see a tab there that says how to install. That's where the video is, and they can just watch that video and, and judge for themselves. Yep, that's me installing it, so... Yeah, it's it's very simple. Okay. Now, you said this thing is launching on April 2nd, is that what you said? Correct. It's on kickstarter.com. And if you're not familiar with Kickstarter, it's kind of a, a launching pad for new ideas. We're okay. going to do that avenue first. And then after that, it usually takes, usually Kickstarter lasts about 30 days. And then we'll launch it again on our website. Okay. Through Kickstarter, we're not allowed to advertise as far as cost or anything. They have to get first crack. Oh, I see. But it will be available for sale on Kickstarter. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. And since you're basically kickstarting it, basically kickstarting your idea, you get a discount when you do go on Kickstarter. It's going to be cheaper than what's going to be uh, retail price. Okay, so you would go on Kickstarter dot com, you know, what search on the door defense or something like that, and then uh, you'd order it. And what does it come in the mail? UPS? How's that work? It's going to come in the mail. We're kind of sorting out the logistics for shipping right now. The product is, you know, only two inches wide, but it's eighty inches long. Yeah, yeah. So we're trying to do different different avenues to try and keep the cost down. That's one of our biggest hurdles uh, because, you know, as far as the U.S. Postal Service and stuff like that goes, it's very expensive to ship something that's that long. Yeah. And we don't want to have to cut it in half or quarters or whatever to make it not look as nice sure. as professional. Now, can you give us any idea on what the, the unit price is going to be to the consumer? It's approximately through Kickstarter.com. It's going to be around eighty dollars. Okay. And retail is probably going to be another fifteen to twenty percent. Mm -hmm. Well, I, that sounds less than some of the other products that I've heard that don't seem as easy to install. The nice thing about the product, the, the door defense, is that once it's installed, you don't even know that it's there. It's like an unseen thing, with, but it's always there protecting you. So, why? Well, I think you got a, a good idea here, Doug. And also, I mean, if somebody has a door that's kind of beat up, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's, it's, it's made out of wood that, you know, starts to fade and needs painted, it, it just looks bad. Or if somebody had an invasion at one point in time and kicked the door in, the problem is replacing that door, you got to replace the whole jam and the door and everything, yeah. you're probably looking at a $1,000 bill mm -hmm. for... You know, 80 bucks, you put this over top, and it looks like a brand new door. Hmm. You know, actually, you have just described my home. I, the, the house that I live in, it's an, <laughs> old, it's an old farmhouse, and it was built in 1899. And, uh, you know, I, you've just Why, sold... Mine's 100 years old, too. Yeah, you know, you've sold a couple of units already, because I really would like to harden up my, my front door. You know, I would love for that for it to take them 20, 30, 40 seconds to break through that front door so that I can give them the proper greeting uh, once they get inside. I'd like to be ready for that. So, um, Doug, again, we're about out of time here. But, again, tell us uh, where people can go uh, to, to learn all about your product. It's thedoordefense.com, 
Kickstarter launched April 2nd. Uh, you can get it at discount at kickstarter.com starting April 2nd. Okay. All right, Doug, thank you very, very much for being on the Home Defense Show. We, we wish you all the best. Thank you, Skip. Really appreciate it. Okay, folks, uh, go ahead and take another two-minute break. Uh, while we're away, go out and get yourself a, a nice ice-cold can of Mountain Dew. I know it's not good for you, but drink it anyways just to prove you're a man. And then uh, check out EliteFirearms.us uh, and then FirearmsLegal.com slash Midwest Tactical and also TheDoorDefense.com. Check out this new product. This is Skip Coriel on the Home Defense Show. Don't go anywhere. We will be right back. Welcome to my dad's home defense radio show. You're going to love it. Hey, folks. I want to tell you about my book, Civilian Combat, the Concealed Carry Book. More and more people across the country are seeing the dangers in society and are deciding to carry concealed to protect themselves and their families. My new book lays it out step by step. It'll teach you how to protect and defend the ones you love. Get the benefit of 17 years of teaching experience and a lifetime of training for this important role in society and in your family. You can get Civilian Combat real easy. Just go to Amazon.com, search on Skip Coriel Civilian Combat, and it'll pop right up there. Don't put it off any longer. Get Civilian Combat, the concealed carry book by yours truly, Skip Coriel. This is Colonel Danny Gillum. I host Front Lines of Freedom, a weekly syndicated military talk radio show. One of my co-hosts is Skip Coriel, the host of this show. We cover things that impact military and veteran communities, and we do it from the veteran's perspective. The show is broadcast across the nation and is also available as a podcast on our website, frontlinesoffreedom.com. Please join Skip and me weekly on Frontlines of Freedom. This is Skip Coriel from the Home Defense Show, and I want you to have the very best handgun that money can buy. And that's why we recommend you visit Larry Jackson at Elite Firearms and Training. As a concealed carry instructor, I see people every week out on the range with guns they can't shoot properly because they didn't know what to buy. That will never happen at Elite Firearms and Training. Larry Jackson will personally fit you with your very own personal defense pistol. So call Larry Jackson today at 616-299-8715 or visit EliteFirearms.us. Skip, it's time for the Armed America Report. What do you have? All of us here at Frontlines of Freedom want our listeners to get trained and get armed in that order. We fully support the right to keep and bear arms for all law-abiding families, and we encourage you to find out about the laws governing use of deadly force in your state and follow them to the letter. And, of course, don't forget to follow the rules of safety and common sense whenever you're carrying a firearm to protect the ones you love. What's the story this week, Colonel? Well, Georgia authorities named a 68-year-old business owner an honorary deputy for his heroism during an armed robbery. The businessman was closing the shop for the day when two young thieves burst through the door. They demanded his money, then one struck him in the face for a good measure. Although the store owner was dazed, he grabbed a shotgun and fired, striking both suspects. Both teens were hospitalized and have since been taken into custody and charged in connection with the robbery. The Burke County Sheriff's Office later recognized the victim, presenting him with the honorary deputy title and badge. Thanks, Colonel. I love stories like this, and every year as I grow older, I love them all the more because it inspires me and gives me hope. One thing all humans have in common is aging. All of us will get older. In fact, that is the best we can possibly hope for. In my concealed carry classes, I have a mix of demographics from people as young as 18 all the way up to almost 90. If you can still hold a gun steady and point it in the right direction, then I'll do my best to teach you how to use it for self-defense. In my classes, I'll pick out the youngest, strongest, most good-looking man, and I'll tell him this. Don't get cocky, kid. After class today, I want you to go home and step into the bathroom. Look into the mirror and repeat after me. This is the best I'm ever going to feel, the best I'm ever going to look. This is the strongest and fastest that I'll ever be. From this point on, it's downhill for the rest of my life. And then I point at the 75-year-old man sitting beside him and say, Kid, that is your future. Ha <laughs> ha, I love it. My point is that although we age and lose many of our abilities, we don't have to just roll over and die simply because some young kid has a bad attitude and wants to mug us. This 68-year-old man gave these kids a wake-up call and taught them the age-old lesson of respect your elders. 
Our parents used to teach us that as a matter of daily living, but now it happens less and less. Here's my advice to the parents out there. Teach your kids to respect the oldest among society, because if you fail in that task, some 68-year-old man who isn't ready to die just might have to teach them the hard way. Skip, very well said. Okay, folks, welcome back to the Home Defense Show. This is your host, Skip Coriel. Hey, last two segments were pretty good. That Doug Garzina from D&G Innovations, thedoordefense.com, that was some pretty good stuff. Now, I was speaking with Doug offline, and he is going to send me a free sample that I can mount on my door and then uh, go ahead and, and test it out, which I am going to do. So, the way I figure it, if I can go ahead and install this, then any of you can install it, because I am all thumbs. So, I'll go ahead, as soon as I get that, I'll install it, I'll let you know how simple or difficult it was, and I'll be brutally honest about that. And I might even bang on that uh, door for a little while, uh, just to see how it works. So, another good home defense tip for all of you from the Home Defense Show. Okay, now, this is the part of the show where I tell you what I really think. And today we're going to talk about handgun selection. I was on the gun range last week teaching a concealed carry class when one of my students approached me with a gun question. She wanted to rent a pistol from me for the range time, but she insisted that I provide her with one of two makes and models. She named them off and I told her I didn't have either of those. She seemed surprised by that so I asked her, you're a brand new pistol shooter, why do you think you have to shoot either of those two guns or nothing at all? She then proceeded to explain to me that all of her friends had told her that those were the only two guns that she'd be able to shoot. My BS detector immediately began to go off. In fact, it was so loud that I had to put on my hearing protection. I said, ma'am, I would seriously question anyone who told me that I had only two choices out of the hundreds and hundreds of makes and models of handguns that are out there. She seemed offended and aghast that I would question the opinions of her friends. We spent three hours on the range that afternoon and the woman never smiled, not once. By the end of the day, I had hooked her up with Larry Jackson from EliteFirearms.us so I think she'll eventually get the right gun for her needs. Folks, I hear these kinds of stories all the time, and I want to warn you against dogmatic concealed carry instructors. If someone looks you in the hairy eyeball and tells you that you must shoot a five-shot revolver, or that you must shoot a three eighty pocket gun, or that you must shoot a full-frame forty-five caliber 1911, then you should consider running away from them. No one but you can decide what pistol is best for your own self-defense needs. I can't tell you how many times I've had women come to the range with guns they can't handle because of excess recoil or how many men I've had come with pocket mouse guns that just weren't the best choice for them. There is absolutely no substitute for shooting a gun before you buy it. You can line up 10 shooting instructors against the wall and ask them all the same question and you'll likely get at least five different answers. This is not rocket science, folks. In fact, I submit that choosing the right personal defense gun is more art than science. There are just way too many factors to consider while picking out your defensive pistol. First, you've got concealability. Can I hide it? Do I need to hide it? Do I want to hide it? Everyone will have a different answer to that question. This goes hand in hand with the weight and bulk question. A compact pistol is easier to conceal and more comfortable to carry but it's also a lot harder to shoot accurately. You have to balance that and make compromises. How important is accuracy for you? How far will you likely be taking shots? For myself, I usually carry a nine round semi-auto compact simply because I spend most of my time in a low crime rural setting. Weight is important to me because I have back issues as well. However, When headed into the big city, or when I'm working on my church security team, I carry my 18-round 9mm semi-auto because I want the benefit of increased accuracy at longer ranges 
and the extra ammo supply. The added weight is tough on my back, but hey, that's what I signed up for, and I have to take the responsibility of protecting the flock seriously. Then, of course, you have the question of caliber. Some people say that if it doesn't start with a four, then it's not big enough. That's nonsense. The people saying this are usually men with large egos and small... Well, you get the idea. While it's true that no one ever came out of a gunfight saying, Oh man, I just wish I'd had smaller bullets. It's equally true that it doesn't matter how fast you miss. I used to carry a forty caliber, but have since transitioned to a 9mm. Why? Well, because I'm 60 years old now and I can no longer handle the recoil. My second, third, and fourth shots are just as important to me as my first, so I need to handle the recoil quickly and get back on target if I'm going to save my life. Remember, the first person in a gunfight to make a critical hit will usually win that fight, and critical hit is any hit to the central nervous system or a major organ. You have to make the hits, and you have to make them fast. At the range today, I had a man shooting a full-frame 9mm, and he was doing very poorly. I recommended he come down to a full frame 22 caliber. Some people would scoff at that, but I'm here to tell you that accuracy is paramount. Shoot the highest caliber that you can safely and accurately control. Do I shoot a 22? No way, because I can handle a 9mm very well. But someday, I may have to come down in caliber simply because of my age and lack of strength. Not all guns are created equal and not all shooters are created equal. And then there's the age-old question, which sometimes ends in an argument, as to whether to carry a revolver or a semi-auto. I never tell people what they should carry. I simply give them the facts and my opinion, and then they can make up their own mind. If they buy the wrong gun, well, then they can just buy a different gun next time. Expensive, but certainly educational. Most people carry a semi-auto because of the increased ammo capacity, rate of fire, and accuracy, and also the speed and ease of reloading. Most defensive revolvers are a five-shot and you're done proposition. Now, here's the part where people say, if you can't get the job done in five, then you're a lousy shot. Well, in the average self-defense scenario, that's probably true. A mugging comes to mind, which is pretty common, and always at short range. But I personally do not want to limit my defensive capabilities to a range of 10 feet or less. I don't want to go after a mass murderer who is armed for bear with a five-shot revolver. Nothing against revolvers. I know they're capable and very, very good at their job. But they have limitations that I'm not willing to accept. So, if you settle for a revolver, then become a very good shot, cool under pressure, and practice at longer distances. But you should be doing all these things anyways, no matter what gun you shoot. But understand this, when all things are equal, the revolver will never outshoot the semi-auto. It wasn't designed for that, and it doesn't have the ability to shoot at longer ranges. And here's where people counter by saying, but revolvers never jam. Folks, no gun is perfect, certainly not the semi-auto. However, with practice and a basic understanding on what causes malfunctions, most people can prevent jamming most of the time. If you practice with your semi-auto and perform your due diligence and research, your semi-auto will not malfunction. Granted, semi-autos are less forgiving in many ways, and some people can't work the slide, but most can. Here's the long and short of it. We all live and die based on decisions we make, so make good decisions. Choose a gun that feels good in your hand with a natural point of aim, with the highest capacity that is practical for you, that has a long sight radius, and a gun that you can shoot rapidly and accurately. And if you disagree with me, then I respect your opinion. And that's what I really think. Okay, folks, well, hey, I'll probably get some email about that one. But that's okay. I have my opinion, and I can support it. We are about out of time. Next week, we're going to have, oh, one of our better interviews. Uh, his name is Peter Heck. He is from PeterHeck.com. And that's H-E-C-K. Go to PeterHeck.com between now and next week and find out what Peter Heck is all about. We're going to be talking about school shootings. He is a public school teacher for the last 17 years. And he's going to tell us what he thinks about this, you know, why it's happening and what we can do to cut down on that. 
very, very interesting man and very good interview. Okay, we're about out of time, folks. Um, head on out to Amazon.com, pick up Civilian Combat, the concealed carry book by yours truly, Skip Coriel. Check out our sponsors at EliteFirearms.us and also at Firearms Legal slash Midwest Tactical. Don't go another week without protecting your family in all aspects. Okay, folks, that about wraps it up for this week's episode of the Home Defense Show. Until next week, remember your purpose in life is to find something greater than yourself and serve it. Always remember, God, family, country, in that order. It's important how you live, but it's equally important how you die. Your family and the ones you love need your protection, so train, always train, stay alert, stay alive. Until next week on the Home Defense Show, this is your host, Skip Coriel. God bless you, God bless your family, and God bless America. Thank you for joining us this week on The Home Defense Show. Now, get out there and protect the ones you love. We'll see you next week with more of the best in home defense. Bye-bye, boys. Have fun storming the castle.